All right, welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research, papers, and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. So I have a little cold this week. I apologize for that in advance, but the show must go on, right? So some news. Brother Juan Sepulveda over at the Winding Stairs podcast just released episode 8. It is an amazing episode. I encourage you all to go check it out. And uh, he was kind enough to make some very nice graphic images for our show uh, at Whence Came You. So we're going to update the Facebook cover photo uh, using his artwork, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, Also, new episode of Far From Centered will be out soon with special guests Eric Shaw from Tactical 16, Jeff Whitby, the hilarious comedian out of Los Angeles, and myself. Links will be up on that soon as well. Good wishes toward my friend and brother Travis Apollonius, who helped me out with a video project when I first got started with this podcast, and I was creating videos for YouTube and Vimeo and the like, and he had created some very nice graphics that we used to do a famous Freemason video. He has decided to demit from the fraternity, Uh, and follow his spiritual path, and I wish nothing but the best to uh, Brother Travis Apollonius. You're always going to be my brother and my friend, so uh, best of luck, brother. I'm waiting to get quiz number four back for the Master Craftsman. Definitely looking forward to that and some studying exercises going through the Scottish Rite uh, ritual and monitor. Uh, If you are in the southern Illinois area, Uh, Coming up in the next week or so, brother Todd E. Creason has put together another 5K run-walk event for Ogden Lodge. Uh, He did it last year, and they they raised quite a bit of money for the Masonic Charities, and they're doing it again this year. So if you're going to be in the Southern Illinois area, please check that out. Uh, It's a great cause, and you might even meet uh, Todd Creason. I would be there, um, unfortunately... I am scheduled to do another 5K about two weeks after that, and I used my last vacation days at work uh, for that purpose. Brother Mike Shirley, one of the regular contributors of the Midnight Freemasons, has published a new book called Daily Influences, Meditations for Servant Leaders. It is a book which features 365 passages, 365 pages, uh, so one per day, which gives some inspiration. Also, it's an ebook, and it's two dollars and ninety nine cents. You cannot beat that. Mike Shirley is a past master and a professor who does, in fact, hold a doctorate. In fact, I can't. Don't quote me on this, but he has a couple doctorates, I think, actually. And I'm not joking. So he is one of the most intelligent guys that I've ever had the pleasure of working with and to call my friend. And uh, I think his new book is something all of us can benefit from. So if you have a minute, check it out. It's uh, it's on Kindle, and uh, we're going to have the links to that also on our website. And you can find it there on www.wcypodcast.com, or just go to Amazon.com and type in uh, Michael Shirley or the title, which is Daily Influences, Meditations for Servant Leaders. Uh, this week I wanted to read a piece by... Brother Ira Gilbert, and he's the guy who kind of made me the lodge education officer for my lodge, or at least planted the seed, I think. He came and visited our lodge and explained the need for a Masonic education officer, and uh, the, the master of my lodge, Brother Mike, actually came to me and said, hey, yeah, would you mind doing that? And of course, being involved with the podcast and uh, loving Masonic education, I jumped at the chance. So, uh, Brother Ira Gilbert is a profound writer Uh, well-known throughout Illinois within Masonic circles. And uh, at first, this paper that I'm going to read, it first made the rounds, and it was sent to me from Brother Brian Shimian from the Midnight Freemasons as well. Uh, I believe he was the first person to send it to me. And then I got it a second time from another guy at my lodge, uh, Brother Bud. Um, So I think I should take the hint and probably read that paper. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into that paper and it's called the ninth day so again this is the ninth day of av and the lessons of freemasonry by ira gilbert past master pddgm july 16th 2013 on the secular calendar corresponds with the ninth day of the month of av known as tisha b'av on the hebraic calendar the secular date analogs to the hebrew date 
of the ninth of Av will vary from year to year. The ninth of Av represents a day of profound mourning in the Jewish community. Tradition tells us that it was on this date that both the Temple of Solomon, identified as the first temple, and the second were destroyed. The second temple was built on the same foundations as the first temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Since the teaching of Freemasonry is dependent on the existence of King Solomon's temple, a similar emotion of sadness should go throughout the Masonic community as well. Our Masonic ritual for the three degrees of Blue Lodge Masonry is based on the construction of the Temple of Solomon. The ritual also teaches the belief in a supreme being. In addition, the ritual teaches the creed that there is a life beyond death or the principle that are there can be a resurrection after death. How then can it be that these teachings of the Blue Lodge degrees are not in conflict with the teachings of the Hebraic faith, that today there has not been a resurrection of the temple in Jerusalem? Should the sensation of sadness be ameliorated by the belief that there can be a resurrection of the temple and a third temple be raised? Let me start with the history of what led to the building of King Solomon's temple. The book of Exodus in the Old Testament teaches that when Moses descended from the mount with the word of the supreme architect of the universe. The supreme architect gave specific instructions for the building of a tabernacle that was to house the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle was to be portable so as to carry the Ark of the Covenant to the Promised Land. The details not only of the Ark but of the construction of the tabernacle were set forth by the supreme architect. When King Solomon ascended the throne of the Hebrew people, he saw the necessity of a building, of building a temple that was to not only be a place of prayer, but also a home to house the Ark of the Covenant. The Temple of Solomon was built in two sections, one housing a place for prayer, and another, the Holy of Holies, made to house the Ark of the Covenant. The books of Kings and Chronicles in the Old Testament narrate the story of the building of King Solomon's temple. It is recorded that King Solomon sought out the services of Hiram, king of Tyre, to aid the building of the temple. Tyre was the capital city of Phoenicia and is today located along the coast of Lebanon. Hiram, king of Tyre, enlisted the aid of Hiram, a worker in metals, to assist. This is thought to be the person of Hiram Abiff, so prominent in Masonic ritual. There is no archaeological proof of the existence of King Solomon's temple. There is some archaeological proof in the form of a building block that was found near the site of the second temple on the Temple Mount. Inscribed on in the side of the building block were the Hebrew words, Labet Hat Tika. Side note, I probably butchered that word, and I apologize. In English, this is translated as the place of blowing the ram's horn. This was found at the exact location where it is thought that the ram's horn was blown to call the people to prayer in the temple. There is conflict between Hebrew scholars and secular scholars as to the dates that King Solomon's temple was in existence. It is believed by some that the construction of King Solomon's temple was commenced in the 10th century BCE. It is thought that King Solomon's temple was destroyed in the secular year 587 BEC by the Babylonian forces of Nebuchadnezzar II during the siege of Jerusalem. The belief is that King Solomon's temple stood for about 410 secular years. However, the Masonic creed of the possibility of a resurrection might be applied to the first temple, as well as the life of our brethren. The second temple was constructed on the site of the first temple on the Temple Mount. Where there is no evidence of the architecture of the second temple, it was probably the same as the first temple, and was not only a place of prayer, but housed the Ark of the Covenant. It is thought that the second temple was constructed in a secular year of 515 BCE and lasted until it was destroyed by Romans in the year 70 CE. The western wall that today stands on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is thought to be the last standing remnant of the second temple. The Temple Mount today is of major importance to the people of three faiths, the Hebrew, Christian, and Islamic beliefs. To the Jewish people, it is the location of both the Temple of Solomon and the Second Temple. To the people of the Islamic faith, it is a location of the Dome of the Rock, or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It was reported that the construction of the Dome of the Rock was similar to the construction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Can there now be a resurrection of the Hebrew Temple in the form of a third temple? There are many who think that this very well be the case. Scholars believe that a third temple was prophesied in the Bible in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel predicted that there would be a third house of prayer on the Temple Mount for the people of Israel. This presents significant problems for the Jewish and Islamic people. The Islamic people feel that 
Any encroachment to the area of the Al-Aqsa Mosque would be a desecration of their faith. The Jewish people feel that the erection of King Solomon's Temple predates the construction of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and gives them the prior right to the site. There is even much disagreement among the various divisions within Hebrew faith as to what is needed for a third temple to be built. The architect of the third temple is prophesied in Ezekiel 40-42. The Jewish people who follow the Orthodox viewpoint in order to have a third temple, there must be a return of the Messiah. To people of the Christian faiths, the Messiah has already returned. To those who follow the Islamic faith, the Dome of the Rock is a holy place where Muhammad the Prophet came after leaving the holy city of Mecca. The Dome of the Rock is the second holiest location in Islam. Thus, it can be seen that the construction of a third temple will be extremely difficult to accomplish. To those of the Jewish faith, the three denominations have differing viewpoints as to when the Messiah will return. In the Orthodox Jewish view, the Messiah will return in the Hebrew year of 6000. This corresponds to the secular year of 2240 CE. The consecutive and reform sects in Judaism do not predict when the Messiah will return. There is already some discussion of how the three religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam can agree as to the building of a third temple on the Temple Mount. An Islamic cleric in Turkey postulated that there is room on the Temple Mount to build a third temple without infringing on the location of the Dome of the Rock. Those of the Jewish faith also believe that there can be a construction of a third temple. It remains to the teachings of Freemasonry to include the building of a third temple within their ritual. There has already been a death of King Solomon's temple and its resurrection in the form of a second temple. Can there be another resurrection as seen in the construction of a third temple? Masonic teachings regard death and resurrection would seem to explain that, indeed, there could be a resurrection of the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The lessons of Freemasonry may be able to go a long way in bringing Judaism, Christianity, and Islam together. Freemasonry already instructs that all people are on the level, no matter what their religious persuasion is. So long as there is a belief in a supreme being, there appears to be no reason why there cannot be another resurrection of the temple in Jerusalem. Alright, so there you have it. A pretty well flowing piece. To be honest, when I first scanned the paper, just visually looking over it, I was a little hesitant to read it because of the mentions of different religions. I don't generally like to talk much about different religions and get in depth because of the way it divides men. Uh, but I think that this piece does in fact show how we are all brothers and how we do work together. Unfortunately, the rest of the world doesn't much follow the creed for helping each other out like we do as Freemasons. But maybe one day, it's time for me to ask you to support the show. So please check out our show apps for your mobile device. It's a bit different than just streaming the show through iTunes. Um, in addition to the streaming aspect, you also can save the shows on your hard drive, on your mobile phone. In addition to just streaming, you can also get access to the papers that we read via PDF files and the Masonic wallpapers for your mobile device. And those come out every single week. The cost of the app is 2 bucks, and all the proceeds go right back into the show. If you want, we do have a donation button run through PayPal, which is which is 100% secure. And again, all donations go right back into the show. You also get a little thank you note in the mail from me uh, just to say thanks. And lastly, our affiliate on it Labs. Check those guys out. If you want to supercharge your mind and body, everything those guys make is great. All organic, non-GMO, no caffeine. Nothing unnatural. In fact, recently they even got rid of the dyes that they were using in the capsules from their products like Alpha Brain, which is really cool that they do that. Uh, you can follow the links on our website, www.wcypodcast.com. Click on the links for On It. And they just released some new chocolate as well, which is spiced with capsaicin. So it's a spicy chocolate. It's 100% natural, really tasty stuff. And it's good for you. Chocolate that's good for you. In addition to anything that you buy there, you can use our promo code WCY at checkout, and that gets you 10% off your purchase. It doesn't cost you any more when you go through our links, but it does help out the show since on it gives a little bit back to us to help keep the hard drive spinning and the microphones recording. Next is this week's famous Freemason. Kind of unique because we know about Prince Hall being the first black member in the United States and the incredible legacy that he started, but this guy is a little less known, and he was the first black Freemason ever documented. This famous Freemason has an incredible story, but I have to warn you, it ends with a deplorable act. Something so outrageous that it should upset you even today. But with that warning, I should say to all of you listening that we should focus on what this Freemason did for the whole of the fraternity, especially across Europe. Angelo Solomon 
probably belonged to the Kanuri ethnic group. His original name, Madi Mackay, is linked to a princely class in the Sokoto state in modern-day Nigeria. He was taken captive as a child and arrived in Marseille as a slave, eventually transferring to the household of Marchioness in Messina, who oversaw his education. Out of affection for another servant in the household, Angelina, he adopted the name Angelo and chose to celebrate September 11th, his baptismal day, as his birthday. After repeated requests, he was given as a gift in 1734 to Prince George Christian Lobkowitz, the imperial governor of Sicily. He became the prince's valet and traveling companion, accompanying him on military campaigns throughout Europe and reportedly saving his life on one occasion, a pivotal event responsible for his social ascension. After the death of Prince Lobkowitz, Solomon was taken into Vienna, into the household of Joseph Wenzel I, Prince of Liechtenstein, eventually rising to chief servant. Later, he became royal tutor of the heir to the prince. On February 6, 1768, he married Magdalena Christiani, a wealthy widow and sister of the French general Francois Etienne de Kellerman, who was the general for Napoleon Bonaparte. A cultured man, Solomon was highly respected in the intellectual circles of Vienna and counted as a valued friend by Austrian Emperor Joseph II and Count Franz Moritz von Lacy. In 1783, he joined the Masonic Lodge True Harmony, whose membership included many of Vienna's influential artists and scholars of the time, among them musicians like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Joseph Hayden. Lodge records indicate that Solomon and Mozart met on several occasions and were friends. It's likely that the character Bassa Salim in most Mozart's opera, The Abduction from the Seraglio, was based on Solomon. Eventually becoming Grand Master of that lodge, Solomon helped change its ritual to include scholarly elements. This new Masonic direction rapidly influenced Freemasonic practice throughout Europe. During this time, Solomon became a member of the Freemasons and was considered almost equal to his fellow Masons, but he continued to face a thicket of race and class prejudices. Beneath the surface appearance of integration lurked Solomon's remarkable destiny. Though he moved smoothly in high society, the exotic quality ascribed to him was never lost, and over the course of his lifetime was transformed into racial characteristics. He could not escape the taxonomic view that focused on typical racial characteristics like skin color and hair texture. Now, this is where it gets grotesque, shameful, and downright deplorable and ungodly. So Solomon dies of a stroke in 1796. Keep in mind, he was a grand master of True Harmony Lodge, past master, and he literally became a specimen of the quote-unquote African race. Instead of receiving a Christian burial, Solomon was at the request of the director of the Imperial Natural History Collection, skinned, stuffed, and made into an exhibit within the cabinet of curiosities. Decked out in ostrich feathers and glass beads, his mummy was on display until 1806 alongside stuffed animals, transformed from a reputable member of intellectual Viennese society into an exotic specimen. By stripping Solomon of his insignia, of his lifetime of achievements, ethnologists instrumentalized him as what they imagined to be an exemplary African quote-unquote savage. Solomon's daughter Josephine sought to have his remains returned to the family, but her petitions were in vain. During the October Revolution of 1848, the mummy burned. However, there was a plaster cast of Solomon's head made shortly after his death from the stroke in 1796, and it's still on display in the Rollet Museum in Baden. Now again, if you can believe that, it's true. It's just so damn disturbing that something like that had happened to such an esteemed brother. But let's let him live on in our memory as a just and upright brother and toast his philosophical gifts to the craft. He was a member of True Harmony Lodge. So that's it for this week. Please remember to check us out on Facebook and or follow us on Twitter at Wentz KMU. Check out the Midnight Freemasons page for three new articles each week at www.midnightfreemason.blogspot.com or you can just click through from our website, wcypodcast.com. The link is at the top. Additionally, I need to say hi to our podcast partners, brother, 
Juan Sepulveda of the Winding Stairs podcast, and you can follow him at Winding Stairs 33, and also Brother Rob Lewis over at the Far From Centered podcast, and you can follow him at Far From Centered or FFC or Robert P. Lewis. Check out our Masonic businesses, PB&J Water, run by Brother Jeff Koch, who will take care of you in the way of water purification. Also, please check out the authors that I link under the Masonic businesses, like Brother Todd Creason, Charles Harper, Rob Lewis, and now Brother Mike Shirley as well. I know they will appreciate you checking out their material, and I do as well. They are my personal friends and your brothers. Anyway, enough of my yapping for this week. Have a wonderful seven days, and I'll talk to you all next week. Stay on the level, and for whence came you, I'm Robert Johnson.